Hello everyone. Welcome to Homemaking Radio, a place that you can listen while you walk, work, uh, sleep. <laughs> and welcome to all my all my commenters and listeners and readers. If you're new here or if you're old, please go to the description box on the channel underneath the video and click on the link that I have provided so you can go see the entire blog and the post on which I have embedded this video and you can also see some of the other things written out that I may have quoted. And so today I have a lot of things to discuss but I don't know where to start. Well that's why I had the three subjects to work with and one was getting you ready your prep as, well, as I call it and the other was the actual homemaking and then we talked about people and I read things and I homeschool you if you like. I'll warn you before I start homeschooling you so you can shut it off if you object to it. However, we have learned since you have been here that all homeschooling is is things that you learn at home. And uh, if someone is talking to you, they're homeschooling you. And if you are listening to the media, it's homeschooling you. So it's just a matter of choosing. Uh, what you want to learn and you can become self-taught or autodidactic because what we do in homeschooling is teach everyone how to figure things out or how to learn how to go about finding things and I, I remember uh, someone that uh, was objecting to his mother was trying to and he was older actually he was a, a, a man and his he had lost something so his mother was suggesting uh, that that he try to find it and he said how can I find it if I don't know where it is now that is silly that's the type of thing a, a child that hasn't learned how to find things how to figure things out and the Bible says seek and you will find well what we want to do in homeschooling is teach you how to search how to seek and you could do that yourself you could figure out how to go look for something and one of the best examples as a parent when you have young children who have lost something you say things like let's look under the chair let's and then you go around with them and you search with them that's how you train a child is you first of all you do it with them so they will always learn to search and then they learn that sometimes things fall behind something or sometimes things are covered up by something so you lift it up and you search well it's the same with knowledge and wisdom and understanding you have to know how to find out about them how to search and so today I have a few things to discuss with you and of course as I told you I don't know where to begin I will read to you and I will discuss a few things with you and I'll also tell you that getting ready this is important your appearance and your preparation I call it preparation uh, that it uh, is your per part of your personal responsibility just like your work and doing the best you can is an offering to God your preparation and getting ready is part of your personal responsibility to God to take care of yourself spiritually and physically and may I suggest that some of the physical care that you give yourself the uh, bathing and dressing and uh, stretching and exercises and those routine things you do that seem kind of ritualistic that they can contribute a lot to your emotional stability and as a homemaker ladies some of you may not have discovered this uh, because it can make you feel sometimes because homemaking is something you do by yourself you don't do it in a group uh, and as a matter of fact it's almost impossible to do in a group because I've got to keep track of the group and take care of the group and never get the thing done that you need to get done and sometimes it's easier to do it yourself and so even in your home with your family around you everybody will have an individual job to do and uh, some things be done together but mostly you learn to work on your own and be very independent and you can start to feel that uh, you're a stranger in a foreign land 
because while you are living alongside of what the rest of the world has done and, and you're going and getting your errands done and your shopping and stuff, you know that you're different. You feel it. You feel that you are different. But uh, anyone who follows this route uh, and those of you especially who follow the teachings of Christ are going to feel different. It's a natural result of it. It's part of the, what, what do they call it, uh, part of the territory. And uh, you walk through life as though you are a stranger in a foreign land. That, uh, that is in the Bible. We're strangers in a foreign land. Uh, it has helped me so much because I'll always... I always wondered, you know, why do some people feel different or feel left out? You will be left out because, uh, like it says in 1 Corinthians, they think it's strange that you walk not with them. You don't uh, do the same uh, excess of waste, uh, wasting time, entertain too much entertainment, uh, uh, just out and about and uh, socializing and um, doing things that don't amount to anything, that don't add up to anything. And so they think it's strange that you're not like that. You know, uh, I mentioned in my previous video about people that a lot of activities, even in the Christian circles, are people going out at night for it, leaving their homes, having to go out, go out at night. doesn't include the whole family. I mean, uh, back in the day when they had a uh, some kind of party party, uh, it was a selling party or something they were selling. I don't know. Uh, they used to have uh, brooms and mops, you know, where they would sell brooms and mops, and the get ladies would get together, and they'd all buy this stuff. Uh, but it didn't include the rest of the family. Can you imagine them inviting the husband and children to this uh, selling party? So uh, when you stop going out at night, there's one of the first things that makes you different and of course I live on farmland and none of these women around in this area go out at night they just don't want to drive at night and, and it's young or old uh, the best place for them is of course you know home responsibilities you can't be out at night when you live on an area where there's so many responsibilities in the home especially at night and the evening is a time when we uh, close everything batten down the hatches close everything up uh, get everything ready for the next day and that's one reason to be home full time is you can get ready for the next day and your evening is not in a rush trying to get ready to go somewhere else and that is the story of our life isn't it when we're born uh, especially in this modern era and I feel sorry for the poor children that are born in a era where when they get up in the morning, even when they wake up, even when they're babies, they're taken somewhere else. So what we want to do with Homemaking Radio is encourage people to make the home their center. Bring in what you need to bring in to make it a place of contentment and so that you won't want anything out there. Anything that we want out there, we can probably get at home. We can order things and we can spend more time with our families. And uh, so... I would like to uh, read you a couple of things, but first I want to discuss the home and the homemaking, but also remember what I said about your uh, preparation, getting ready, uh, and your your exercises, things like that, and your uh, just your your little uh, prayers and and your list and that sort of thing. That it is your, it can be your personal sacrifice to God. It seems hard, doesn't it, to get going? But if this is your personal um, ministry to others and your personal sacrifice to God, it makes a big, it's a big motivation. And I wrote down something about motivation in one of the Bible uh, lessons we had for the ladies. And everything that we study in the Bible is related we try to relate it to building your character for your family and for your home and so there isn't just one scripture for women uh, and the rest for everybody else it's all of it is for us and uh, it helps increase our understanding and it keeps us from it keeps us knowledgeable the Bible keeps us knowledgeable study of it and to we're supposed to guard and guide the home and it keeps us from it keeps our families from uh, false 
false ways and false doctrines. And so if we know, if we know the scriptures, then we'll know when we need to uh, guide someone more perfectly in the home, uh, one of our children or someone in the home that is maybe falling for a false doctrine. That's one reason a homemaker needs to know uh, the scriptures. And uh, there isn't just one scripture for her. And you know how she can know it? She can actually just read it. And it's so helpful. And I want to share with you a little later on something that one of the class ladies that comes every week to our Bible study uh, mentioned. And she had just noticed it. And I was almost... I was floored at what she saw in this scripture, so I want to share that with you a little bit later on. And uh, so, I've also got a couple of things to read to you. And you know I have been reading Winsome Womanhood, written in 1900 by Margaret Elizabeth Sangster. If you have something you need to do, please go uh, in a minute. I'll show you my teacup before I go. I acquired this uh, teacup, and it's I love it that it has it looks like a wild rose and it's it was called empire green and it's this has not been used it it's like it's brand new but i acquired it and it's and apparently it's quite old it's an antique and it was from ohio hmm but uh i wanted to share that with you because this was a real uh loved color back in especially in the 1980s but I'm sure this is older than that but it hasn't been used and there's not a scratch on it there's not a stain on it nothing and uh, I wanted to, sh to share that with you I'm going to use it I'm going to wash them up good and use it for uh, for someone who's coming over and uh, so the trouble with some of these colors is they'll be in a thrift shop, shop or Goodwill or somewhere and people just don't want them because we were so inundated with it during a certain era. This was popular during the 1980s. A lot of houses are painted this color around this area so people are just uh, tired of it or not attracted by it. But I thought I would bring this home and uh, use it, see how it worked with my home and uh, really enjoying it that it's brand new. Uh, there's not a mark on it. It just doesn't look like it's it looks like it stayed in someone's shelf for a long time So ladies if you've got something to do now, I'll let you go now I have been reading uh, Winsome Womanhood because it's about the 15 year old girl and No matter how old your girl is or boy these things are really good because she teaches kindness to these young people teaches kindness and how many mothers uh, they thought uh, that children needed to be dealt with sharply and uh, so 15 many 15 year old girls grew up not feeling that they uh, that they had been grown up or been treated like a, a human being or a grown up and I always treated my children no matter what age they were even the little ones like an equal like a grown up it, but with you know with guidance with with uh, you know you, you I wouldn't give them something that they weren't old enough for or give them any responsibility or freedom at a certain age uh, but as they get older they need to know that they are uh, very very wanted and very very special now all our babies know they're wanted we kiss them and hug them and we hold them we carry them around but when they're 15 you might not do that so much to them so you have to make sure that they are gently treated in it mentioned in the last chapter that I read to you not to allow the uh, brothers in the family to pick on her or persecute her or hit her and many of us that grew up with uh, large families with boys we had one of them uh, tapping us on this shoulder and one of us tapping us on this shoulder and we always felt like we were being hit here and hit there and that was the way it was but I decided when uh, I had children I was going to watch that situation I grew up in a big family and you know the parents can't always see everything that's going on and I was more watchful and I'd encourage you to be too so I want to read to you a couple of things that she wrote out of this book and she writes about restlessness and 
wanting to go out in the world to work and I really appreciated that because when uh, our children were younger and just you know reaching an age where they knew how to do things read and write and everything they developed an interest in office office things so their dad brought them home each a pad of graph paper special pencils and pens and paper clips and all those things we had those in those days before the computer and uh, let them set up their own little office and they files everything and they really enjoyed and then we gave them blank checkbooks that we weren't using or and they played and played and played with these and enjoyed organizing and they learned a lot from that and uh, so she mentions this even though it was written in 1900 she says I'm supposing I'm supposing dear rosebud of the little willful willful thorns (laughs) that you are willing to bloom in the home borders that you are not anxious for a wider career than the home offers you these are, however, days of restlessness and aspiration beyond the bounds of the home, as young women are invited on many sides to step into a sphere that seems wider than the circle of home interest. Now, this is something you have to watch for, and all of us who homeschooled in the 1980s, we experienced it, and we didn't know. We were kind of caught like deer in headlights because of the hands that were in the voices reaching out to our children saying oh you're you're 13 now oh you're 15 now oh well you should do have you tried this you should be doing this have you ever heard of this and they will corner we talked about the people that corner people and they will corner uh your young adult children and uh and make them feel awfully stupid they say haven't you ever heard of such and such haven't you ever played this game haven't you ever uh, been here or been there haven't you ever had a you know a little job or anything like that and they will uh, stun them and uh, so they these young people come home from these types of voices because she says here Young women are invited on many sides to step into a sphere that seems wider than the circle of home interests. Now, anything that you want for your daughter or son to have, you can provide it from the home. And do that as long as you possibly can. Because the longer they're at home, the more emotional stability they have and the less likely they will be caught away by someone's suggestion to buy this, get in debt, go share an apartment with someone, and it's money down the drain. They are not really caring about your children. They care about uh, what they can get. They're using them. And so she says, uh, restlessness can occur, occur because young women are invited on many sides to step into a sphere that seems wider than the somewhat uh, circumstru- somewhat circle of home interest well that's true but even a married woman at home somebody there's there's hands out voices out people saying oh could you uh could you join this uh ministry uh could would you like to be involved in my home business which is usually not a or an organic home business but they're selling something that is made by some somebody else or some company and it's uh and they they want to recruit people in it and so even at home even you at home don't get restless because anything you need you can do it yourself you can go out and get it yourself or you can um, order it or you can create a business of your own at home uh, by yourself without involving a lot of other people just make some little thing but you don't have to uh, get so restless that you turn your home into a business So I really uh, would like to memorize this. It says here, Young women of your age are invited on many sides to step into a sphere that seems wider. You know, uh, you all need, I can't emphasize it enough. Most of the women my age that homeschooled their children in the 1980s were, were, suffered this attack. People from everywhere, relatives, friends, church members, strangers, their hands out trying to grab your children. And I mean, sometimes literally, uh, they want, uh, your your children are like meat to them and they uh, feel an obligation to minister to them. They feel an obligation to help them. And 
always remind your children, your family, and I'll remind you, you have parents, you have grandparents, you have brothers, you have sisters, you have other people that uh, you can turn to if you need them. You don't need someone, uh, someone's business or someone's ministry outside of your outside of your home. Now this does not say you have to stay in your house, but home is just with the family. And uh, it's very wise to have some policy at home that if possible everybody do things that everybody's involved in if it's away from home. Uh, you wouldn't come along. We had this trouble. You, you that uh, um, raised your children in the 80s had this trouble when uh, you were homeschooling. Somebody wants one of your children to go home with them or off with them and go do something and then somebody wants another child to go here and you're all separated even though you tried to uh, by homeschooling hoping to have more family uh, time and you just really have to watch out for that and make some kind of policy about it and um, I just can't emphasize that enough because I have seen several uh, homeschooled children that had every chance in the world to be stable and to do well and they were pulled away by these what she calls um, invited on many sides to step into a sphere that seems wider and uh, the, ch the parents you can be trusted to introduce your children to the world you can take them on trips you can introduce them to to life in the world and uh, you don't have to depend on uh, other people so I hope that that lecture is not too unpleasant but uh, there are many reasons for it if your children are out from under your protective care anything can happen and even if nothing physical happens something mental can happen uh, that they get an idea in their head from somebody that things aren't quite uh, fair at home and that their parents don't know what they're doing and then there's trouble forever after that so here is I'll read some more of this chapter on winsome womanhood and it says uh, It says here, May we not urge our thoughtful daughter that she shall continue on at home. If you're 15 and you want to listen to this, if you're 13, if you're 12, if you're 8 and you're able to understand it, please listen to this. But all of us need it, even we uh, vital people, because uh, it's easy for us to uh, get taken, taken off by someone who, I told you about these people that corner you and they somehow, their eyes just kind of... Uh, magnetize you so that you can't get away from them or they or they've got you cornered or their voice or something and it can happen to anybody not just young people we all need to uh the bible talks about walking carefully observing all sides <laughs> huh. may we not urge our thoughtful daughter that she shall continue on at home taking these last few years left as a time to enjoy and prepare for her life outside the family home. Yes, uh, my daughter and my granddaughter too. These uh, later, these later teen years, which aren't, which aren't so old after all, but uh, they are being encouraged to learn all they can about all kinds of things. And uh, one of the children is enjoying taking the Tea Time magazine and making everything in it for for the season and having a big tea for her family and inviting uh, all of us to and and just uh, sewing and just exploring all kinds of things in the realm of sewing and homemaking and given free reign of the house so she can maybe arrange things a little bit better. Remember the last chapter I read you, she said if she finds something in the home that could work better if it was arranged this way or done this way, then let her do it. And uh, so she says, take these last few years as time to enjoy and pre prepare for life outside the family home. The home at this time can be the most challenging place to learn and serve. Well, those of you who have just come home, those of you who are uh, vital, those of you who are in the middle years, you still will find this if you're taking it, if you're focusing on it and you're taking it seriously and trying to stay away from the rush of that 
world out there and just trying to uh, make your home your little bubble, uh, you're going to find out this fact. The home at this time can be the most challenging place to learn and serve. At this time in a young girl's life, now you can qualify that and make it any age. She may be um, she may be too self-conscious to bestow the loving word and kind act. We will never be sorry for the moments of our heedful thoughts for our beloved ones. And then they quote a little kind of a poem or piece of prose here. And this is part of character, being able to do this. I, I must confess that I knew very little about character when I was growing up. I went to uh, public school. And though the preachers at church would say the word character, nobody ever really um, described what would be good character or bad. We knew what a bad character was, uh, but what would be a good character, what would be a more deeply defined good character. And this little poem, it's not really a poem, it's a, yeah, it is a poem, it rhymes. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read it to you, and it tells her uh, how to feel more e at ease in giving uh, good words, okay? We all need, we all needed this. It isn't the thing you do, dear. It's the thing you leave undone, which gives you a bit of heartache at the setting of the sun. The tender word forgotten, the letter you did not write, the flower you might have sent, dear, are your, are your haunting ghosts at night. Well, isn't that true? Most of us uh, lay down at night and unable to sleep, have swirling thoughts, and, and everybody thinks they're uh, kind of going a bit mental, but sometimes it is are those things that are undone that are bothering us. The home daughter who is not discontented with her lot, but on the contrary, is willing to accept her household, her people, her quiet post of service as the one God meant for her, will not find time hanging heavily on her hands. Yes, uh, I notice these young young girls at home, their their time is all booked up. They had they just when they finish one thing at home, they go and do something. They never sit around wondering what they do. They they're excited because they've got some kind of project waiting for them in their room, or they've got they're into in all kinds of different uh, things, and uh, there is much room for tillage in the home vineyard tilling tillage no background ever stands for so much to the conscious conscientiousness of young women nowhere else can she find so many occasions for that lending hand which lightens every pack and so bravely helps the fellow pilgrim along on his journey to the heavenly city uh, that's re she refers several times to pilgrim's progress and that was an allegory story that talked about a guy named Pilgrim that was headed to uh, the heavenly city and how there were these voices and and distractions all along the way come this way come that way and uh, showing just what the what how people can get um, misled and uh, how they can stay on the path but anyway I, I digress she said that this background this home background <clears throat> For a young girl at home and I hope girls you're listening and I hope vital women you're listening to uh, that you can always find someone to help at home <clears throat> and if you're alone and uh, you don't have a family you can help yourself and you can uh, improve in so many ways you've got more time for it I can remember growing up in a big family and only having five minutes or less to quickly uh, wash my uh, face and hands in a basin and comb my hair. There was no time for anything else. You barely had a look at yourself in the mirror because uh, uh, there was only one place to go to freshen yourself and there were a lot of people waiting. Um, and to this day, even though I have my own place to live in, I still carry all my stuff in a little bag in, in and out of the bathroom. Just a habit, you know. Um, so it is not merely an affair of putting a flower in the father's buttonhole and mending the mother's laces. I remember 
my daughter picking out my husband's ties on Sunday morning, picking out a tie, and she'd see what he was wearing, and then she'd run to get something that matched, and and uh, it was so precious. And it, once it's over and it's gone, and they've moved on, it'll never be back again. <laughs> Uh, mending her mother's laces and making the desserts and acting as a go-between when the soldiers in the camp are disgruntled. Yes, I've seen many a uh, young lady at home uh, trying to help the two younger boys who are quarreling about something, trying to soothe that over. That is quite a responsibility, isn't it? And we ought to appreciate them for that. It's just beautiful. These little things count. But they are not all, nor is it the singing of a song in the twilight, nor the playing of a sonata to listeners who hearts, whose hearts keep time to the melody, those partial listeners who bore with small fingers when they beat time with their first lessons. This, too, is much, but not all. Now, here's the cream, as Jane would say, Jane Austen would say. It is being the mother's representative at any and every neighborly social and church function that she cannot attend. You know, uh, sometimes there will be uh, someone who will lose a loved one and my daughter will make a card for all of us. She's, she's the representative. And uh, many times I could not attend some lady's function and my daughter would go in, uh, in my place. And uh, it is assisting the church when they need uh, someone, and it is smoothing of a tangle among the young people. It is being, it is being young, but being dear, sweet, and well poised, and consecrating all you are to God. Surely the home daughter need not fear to magnify her place of honor in God's world, and if she has moments of discouragement, as who has not? May she lean ever on the friend Christ who will always be at her side. It's a beautiful book. I don't believe in everything that's in it. She was uh, uh, of a, I don't know what her religious persuasion is. Occasionally I'll see something that I'm not quite in agreement with, but it doesn't spoil the main. And many people thought this way back in that day. And I still feel a semblance of it from having grown up in the 1950s and having had grandparents born in the late 1800s. I can still uh, understand what she's saying. She's reflecting what uh, the culture of the time believed anyway. So uh, some of the other stuff I can overlook. And now, I want to read to you about Jane Austen and I will first I will read from uh, the ladies site that I have been reading from the last time um, and I wanted I don't know how tired you are of the tea uh, question now I wanted to tell you all I don't I'm not telling everybody to drink the black tea or the Ceylon tea or anything with caffeine and if you don't want to you can make tea out of anything it's just a hot drink with a bit of uh, uh, fruit in it or uh, you know I, I ordered one the other day and um, my daughter made me uh, iced tea out of it and it was the peach tea that was no caffeine in it and it had all kind of the little bits of fruit and stuff and it was so good and it looks so beautiful in the glass and I hope to give you a picture of that. So I'm going to read about uh, this tea. Uh, and then, uh, ladies, I do, don't want to forget to talk about uh, the Hyacinth uh, Syndrome because she's in Wives and Daughters, the wife, of, the new wife of Mr. Gibson. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that. So, here is, it's from uh, a site called Jane Austen's World. I have sent you a link to that before, and uh, if you find it, it's on, you can see the header there, so you'll know you're on the right one, and I'll try to include a link, and I will try to include that poem I read about the things you leave out. And ladies, if you don't have a, even if you do have a girl at home, Pay close attention to yourself. We know we're all going to be teaching our children, but we've got to take the log out of our own eye first uh, before we can teach our children. And at the same time, we can learn what we're teaching them. So that's a good one for all of us. 
Would you care for weak tea or strong tea? Tea is always served uh, tea is always served by the host or hostess or a friend, never by the servants. You know, this is interesting that they had uh, the servants that ran the house and the household, but it was the one thing like that they could uh, all be independent of this household help. They could sit around the table and manage it all themselves. And that's much different than the dinners. So that's one reason I think uh, people like the tea ceremony so much. It makes you slow down. You're just sharing. And in some cases, I'll fill teapots and let everyone have their own pot so they can have what kind they want, what kind of tea they want. And I think I'm going to start doing that more often. Tea is never poured out, then passed several cups at a time, the way coffee may be. You know, they'll pour the coffee and then pass it around. Because it cools more quickly. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, when our ladies are sitting around the table or my family and we're having tea, uh, we just pass the pot around and they pour it themselves. That's why they've got the, the hottest, most fresh cup. Uh, I don't pour it all out and pass it out. It is always taken by the guests directly from the hands of the pourer. So in other words, you wouldn't pour uh, all these dozen of cups of tea and then have everybody go and help themselves. No, you let them pour it themselves or let someone else do it and it's just one at a time handed to the recipient. The ceremony of making tea is almost always included in costume dramas uh, such as Emma and uh, she mentions several others, uh, Jane Austen. In one particular scene, uh, two women enter the drawing room in which a small table has been laid out with an elaborate tea set, fine china, and silver spoons. An assortment of tiny sandwiches, cookies, and scones were arranged upon a beautiful Battenberg lace tablecloth that covered the table. Low tea was meant to blunt the appetite before dinner, so high tea was a was the uh, at the high um, time of five or six o'clock for dinner. That was high tea and low tea was just served casually on a lower table like a coffee table. A tea ceremony provided an intimate setting between the hostess and her guests for it was the hostess who prepared and served the tea catering to each guest and handing them their custom prepared tea one cup at a time. In this time-honored ritual, one of the most important questions that, that would be asked was, would you care for weak or strong tea? Now that's interesting. I always like to include a container, a metal container of hot water for those who don't want it so strong, so they can just dilute it if they have to. Okay, so they ha she has here a a history of low tea, what's called low tea, and a picture of uh, Emma from uh, the 1996 movie Emma and Harriet drinking tea during their visit to Mrs. Elton. Interesting. Samuel Johnson, I've told you about him, I believe he was the author of the first English dictionary, and he was also in Parliament, if I'm not mistaken, and might have been uh, handicapped somewhat. Uh, Maybe, maybe couldn't see out of one eye or something, and was a self-described hardened and shameless tea drinker. Well, I have developed a statement, uh, and I will say, well, I think we should all sit down and have a serious cup of tea. Who has for 20 years, uh, Samuel Johnson was a self-described hardened and shameless tea drinker, who has for 20 years dis diluted his meals with only the fusion of this fascinating plant, whose kettle has scarcely time to cool, who with tea muses the evening, with tea solaces the midnight, and with tea welcomes the morning. His chronicler, James Boswell, remember it was from a book, Boswell's Life of Johnson, that I have often referred to, observed that it was perfectly normal for him to drink 16 cups in very quick succession, I suppose they were quite tiny cups compared to what we have today. 
and I suppose no person ever enjoyed with more relish the infusion of their fragrant leaf than Johnson did. Now here in uh, America and United States, the people, especially in my state, they don't add uh, anything to their tea, and that's one of the reasons they enjoy certain flavors more than others because they pick up the flavor better without the milk and sugar and uh, so when they're drinking uh, just plain tea or uh, black tea they're pretty particular about the flavor so they'll drink tend to drink a more high quality so I thought you might enjoy that and I wanted to see if I could find on this article if she had written anything about Jane Austen but I got very little off of that. So now I'm going to read from Brian Kozlowski's book, The Jane Austen Diet, uh, because he had a little section in here on tea, and it's called In Quest of Tea. Tea now solidly ranks as the one of the healthiest drinks on the planet. Now remember, I'm not just talking about the tea made from the camellia leaf, camellia leaf, I'm talking about anything we use. I have herb garden. I'll go in. I'll make sage tea. I'll make thyme tea. I'll make uh, mint tea, lemon uh, balm tea, anything like that. Thanks. To, uh, I even we even had uh, we've been doing uh, herbs and spices of the Bible uh, before our Bible class starts, and I give them a sample and we make a tea out of it. And last week we did cinnamon tea and we studied online all the benefits health benefits of cinnamon and what it was good for and it reduces the appetite we all decided that was very good tea for us and I served um, Bengal spice by celestial seasonings I'll try to put a picture of that there but we all had a cup of that while we were studying our passage in the Bible and do you know it really did make us feel good and no caffeine in it and uh, you can use those Bengal spice uh, tea bags for other things too they are so cinnamon cinnamon they they can uh, freshen up uh, uh, closed in places and I've got one in my cookbook shelf and uh, when I open my cookbook shelf to get out a cookbook it smells so fragrant and um, so uh, you can drink other things thanks to decades of modern research by those who have studied tea scientifically and thousands of years of human observation it was already china's national beverage in 350 a.d tea is now the easiest cheapest safest and most potent super drink in your arsenal important clarification um, um, he says he's just talking about regular tea, the dried teas of the Camellia sinensis shrub, the tea plant. I have one of those growing outside. I'm just interested to see how that's going to do. I already have picked one of the leaves and is dry, and I'm drying it out to see what happens. Um, so I wanted to just read one more little part of the paragraph here. So he talks about tea is the cup that cheers, according to William Cowper, a favorite poet of Austin's, and obviously one of her favorite beliefs about tea. In almost all her novels, tea is the liquid mood soother, magically bringing comfort con con and content in every s sip. And I'll always remember in the 1995 version of Sense and Sensibility, Fanny gets herself in a tight spot uh, with people who are pressuring her about something and she says tea <laughs> and let's have tea and so since I have said that and last time on the people section which I know you're all fast forward forwarding to the 45 minute because you want to get to the people uh, section uh, we talked I talked last time about the person that corners you and you don't have to be in a corner to get cornered they somehow because of their eyes and their voice and their intense body uh, tension and language and stuff can get you stunned and stopped uh, while they pursue their subject and don't let up until you have agreed to something or until you they are good and ready to quit and you've become their listening um, mechanism and they are also people 
they tend to be the same kind of people that I've discussed before who uh, don't interact. In most conversation, you can say something and pause and just kind of measure the atmosphere to see if it's it's been received or receptive and, and someone will say something back. And if they don't show any interest in it, you'd go to another subject or perhaps say something else and and uh, then you, you, you kind of observe to see how you're doing and if someone is saying anything or, or if it's of any interest. Um, and you wait and see if anyone is listening or if they're participating. But these kind of people don't. They, they can corner a person or corner a whole room and get to talking and they won't notice if you're looking away or if you've even got up and left the room. They won't notice if someone is trying to interact. Most people will pause and then let someone else say something. It's just natural. And uh, But these people don't. Uh, they won't pause so when you have a little space where you maybe you want to interject and say something like oh I see what you're saying or that's nice they don't even want to hear that. They totally ignore it and they'll keep talking. They uh, don't wait. Um, they they don't seem to interact. And it's hard to explain unless you have experienced it. They don't interact. They uh, don't follow these natural rules or inclination that we all have where when someone else is present we might limit what we say to just a few words to, to give them a chance to say something and uh, they don't do that. They just they have their script and they'll follow it till the end and not let anyone interact. Well by that time you've forgotten what they said in the in the first part of it and and you're pretty stunned and uh, if you'll remember they also don't understand. They don't have understanding. Um, when you're trying to tell them something they don't they actually don't have any understanding. They formulate an answer and go with it. And it reminds me of Hyacinth in Wives and Daughters. And you've seen this in the movie where Mr. Gibson was pretty upset with Hyacinth because she changed her mind about something and in, in midstream and got real interested in something that uh, he was not not uh, approving of or something and she said uh, she was just acting real airheaded and she'd say well after all such and such and such and he said Hyacinth uh, you either can't or won't understand what I am saying and that's the way these people are the ones that corner you the ones that talk and do not allow any kind of interaction in between uh, phrases or words like most people will stop and uh, say something and then stop you know they won't keep somebody uh, hold somebody what, what would you call that uh, kind of uh, hold them at attention very long uh, but these people do not they can't and won't understand and uh, they stun the person into attention and submission until they get their way and I will say that one example would be, and I observed this one time, just uh, some woman who had some zucchini and she wanted to get rid of it. It was in her car and uh, this is what some farmers, gardeners do, is they've got the old stuff and uh, didn't get it put up, didn't get it processed and a new crop comes on. They have to get it out of the back of the refrigerator and they want to give it away. And this lady did not want it because she also was a gardener and she had she had plenty. So she stood there and said, no thank you, I've got plenty, I won't take it. And uh, this woman stood there and stunned her into submission and uh, wanted to make her, force her to take that zucchini even though the woman didn't want it. And so she said, this is how she got around it. She'd give one excuse and she'd say, well, you could give it to your such and such. Well, you could use it for such and such. Well, have you made, you know, this with it yet? And tried to interrogate her about what she'd already done with her zucchini, trying to talk her into taking this. And she was just had a, a head full of determination to do this. And that is what they do. And they also defy authority. Because the other woman said, my husband just doesn't want me to bring home anything more of that 
you know, we've got enough, it's been canned, we've baked it and everything, and he just doesn't want any more of it around. And she didn't care. This woman didn't care. She does not care about anyone's authority or even if it's not an authority, the uh, the desires of other people. Uh, for instance, uh, someone else had a similar situation, and she said, you know, my children don't like that stuff so I won't accept it because we won't eat it and she didn't care she didn't care her goal was to get it this lady unpack it on this lady so this is the way these cornering people are and they they will stun the victim until they get their way and then they will also defy authority I have seen young children cornered by such a person and the child says my mommy wants me my daddy wants me or even the mother saying come here and they can't get around the person because they've got them stunned they defy they never go to the parents they never go to the husband they never go to anybody but the one that they think that they can overwhelm and uh so so i just wanted to tell you and and also they don't understand and you can get it in uh, this book a lot of these old books have uh, these old stories like wives and daughters have a character like that so if you're plagued with that sort of thing you can just laugh a little and say that's another character in my uh, in the narrative of my life <laughs> if you're not going to write a novel and now uh, I had mentioned to you uh, something about the fascinating girl last time it got uh, it's getting it gets smeared a lot and gets a lot of bad press by unfortunately uh, people who should know better and who have uh, who have criticized it, but never taken the class, never uh, never read the workbook or book. And I liked the workbook of the Fascinating Girl probably better than anything, because it had really good down to earth stuff. And so I mentioned last time to you that it did, wouldn't do you any good to just just because you're wearing a dress. Now it does make you feel. A little bit more uh, feminine to wear a dress more girlish more womanly to wear a dress I will admit that but it doesn't do any good uh, it it's better to have a, a dress or a skirt on for homemaking if you like it and an apron but uh, just for a feeling of uh, a feeling of what your role is and but this page here uh, I liked her workbook uh, talked about the feminine manner when you are uh, and I'm trying to find that cute thing she did with the bear in the lace <laughs> it was so cute and she said if she's if she's wearing all these these nice uh, feminine clothes but she's behaving like uh, you know loud and boisterous and very masculinely she's uh, she's like a bear in lace and I'm trying to I'm trying to find it but I think it was probably in one of the older books and uh, didn't appear in this one and uh, so here it is the feminine manner it has to go with you know the feminine clothes the hands the walk the voice the facial expressions and the refinement and this could be what um, Miss Bingley was talking about when she was trying to uh, talk to her talk to Darcy about Elizabeth saying well, well you know she she might be able to, uh, Elizabeth might have fine eyes but she should have a, a certain manner and a way of walking and so people think that that's real conceited but there's a practical side to that and she said here do you make any of the following mistakes and so it might be fun it might be fun to uh, just put your daughter in a little homeschool class and practice some of these things use your hands in a firm and uh, she says brusque manner which means a kind of kind of violent you know uh, walk with a heavy gait and uh, so you, you would need to have a teacher you could be the teacher with you could learn about these things uh, have a masculine tone in your voice or yell whistle to get everybody's attention laugh with mouth wide open well when we were young we were told you don't let people see the inside of your mouth um, when you laugh throw your head back eat noisily uh, shake hands with an overly firm grasp 
slap people on the back, uh, sit with legs apart, critical in conversations, harsh facial expressions, frown frequently, uh, and other other things. So you can look up stuff like this and get a, a refinement uh, course for yourself and your daughter if you like. Now I'm going to read one more thing before I go. I have got to finish this little part on wives and daughters after Molly has told Roger that uh, his her father is going to be married. And this is what happens after he says, You will have thought me hard. I can never manage to express what I feel. Somehow I always fall into philosophizing. But I am sorry for you. Yes, I am. But it's beyond my power to help you. So she said, I know you are sorry. And she broke away and ran indoors and upstairs to the solitude of her own room, though she was staying with the Hamleys. He went straight to his mother, who was sitting before the untasted luncheon, as much annoyed by the mysterious unpunctuality of her visitor as she was capable of being with anything, for she had heard that Mr. Gibson had been and was gone, and she could not discover if he left any message for her. And her anxiety about see what happened was, he came and talked to his daughter and became discouraged by her reaction and just turned around and left and her anxiety about her own health, which some people esteemed hypochondriac, always made her particularly craving for the wisdom which might fall from the doctor's lips. Where have you been, Roger, and where's Molly? Miss Gibson, I mean, for she was very careful, careful to keep up a barrier of forms between the young man, her son, and the young woman who were thrown together in the same household. I've been dredging, he said. By the way, I left my net on the terrace walk. I found Miss Gibson sitting there crying as if her heart would break. Her father's going to be married again. Married again? You don't say. Yes, he is. And she takes it very hard, poor girl. Mother, I think if you could send someone to her with a glass of water, a cup of tea, or something of that sort. She was nearly fainting. I'll go myself, poor child, said Mrs. Hamley, rising. Indeed you must not, he said, laying his hand on her arm. We have kept you waiting already too long. You are looking quite pale. Hammond can take it, he continued, and rang the bell. She sat down again, almost stunned with surprise. Whom is he going to marry? I don't know. I didn't ask, and she didn't tell me. That's so like a man. Why, half the character of it lies in the question of who it is. <laughs> but I think in the movie, um, Roger did ask her, do you know the woman he's going to mar marry? And she did tell him in the movie. I gave her the best advice in my power. So to their surprise, Molly came in trying to look as trying hard to look normal. She had bathed her eyes and arranged her hair and was making a great struggle to keep from crying and to bring her voice into order. Bringing your voice into order. You know we don't have that's self control. We don't have that. People don't talk to us about that. You know, that if you are upset, you bring your voice into order. She was unwilling to distress Mrs. Hamley by the sight of pain and suffering, because Mrs. Hamley was also an invalid. She did not know that she was following Roger's injunction to think more of others than of herself, but she was. Mrs. Hamley was not sure if it was wise in her to begin on the piece of news she had just heard from her son but she was too full of it herself to talk of anything else. So I hear your father is going to be married, my dear. May I ask who it is? Mrs. Kirkpatrick. I think she was a governess a long time ago at the Countess of Cumner's. She stays with them a great deal, and they call her Claire, and I believe they are very fond of her. Molly tried to speak of her future stepmother in the most favorable manner she knew how. That's just wonderful. And I am vital... And I've just now learned to do that. I've just now learned to say uh, to anyone who uh, I don't totally agree with <laughs> and who's not my type, you're welcome to come over and sit and have a cup of tea with me. However, I uh, would be more in understanding of their ignorance and more in control of the conversation <laughs> than when I was younger. I think I've heard her, then heard of her. Then she's not very young. 
That's as it, sh it should be. A widow, too. Has she any family? One girl, I believe, but I know so little about her. Molly was very near crying again. Never mind, dear. That will all come in good time. Roger, you've hardly eaten anything. Where are you going? To fetch my net. It is full of things I don't want to lose. Besides, I never eat much in general of anything. So he thought he had better leave the two alone. His mother had such sweet power of sympathy. Sweet power of sympathy. I'd like, I would have liked to have had that, but I never managed it. Uh, that she would draw the sting out of the girl's heart when she had had her alone. As soon as he had gone, Molly lifted up her poor swelled eyes and looked at Mrs. Hamley. She said, He was so good to me. I mean to try and remember all he said. Now that it was such a sweet story. And I uh, wanted to explain more about my uh, refrigerator and my pantry. And that is that uh, we eat so much fresh that it's common for it to look a bit empty because we try to eat things that are fresh so we can't store a lot of it and uh, so that is one reason why if if someone is you know calls by whatever um, and I go to the grocery store probably more often or out to my garden more often and that happens to a lot of people that don't eat a lot of grains or don't have uh, don't store a lot of things so ladies I hope that this has got you through some of maybe sorting through something or a grim job as Emma would have said and I hope you have a lovely day and let me see if I can find tomorrow I'll read you some lists in here I found four lists of character qualities that you can understand and I will try to put them on uh, the page where I where I embed this video and uh, I wanted to just read that one verse um, that I read last time I believe it was um, keep yourselves in the love of God so I will talk to you later and thank you all for any comments that you leave I appreciate it I appreciate everything you do to me for me because if you weren't here I probably wouldn't do this I'll talk to you later bye